Hey, How what's going you? on? It is snowing buckets here. Really? So you guys got what we have then? Because we yeah. had snow for a very long time. It has stopped snowing. So I think it's like snowing everywhere else now. Yes. Yes. I think we're up to eight or nine inches um, and it has not stopped, which is a lot for us. I was going to say that's a lot for anything south of like Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everything shut down. The yeah. whole, you know. <laughs> We have no infrastructure for this. <laughs> yeah, I the thing, so I, I haven't lived in the South for a very long time, but the thing that I have appreciated both living in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, and now in the Northeast is just how prepared we are for snow. Yes. Um, like mm -hmm. the South is just not prepared <laughs> at all. No. No. Which is the revert, like when I go <laughs> North, I'm always surprised at how few air conditioners there are places. Yep, right? yep. Like it's not just standard, right. there's central air everywhere. There might right. be some window units, but here we're prepared for heat. Yeah. Not so, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, what's good? What's going on? You know, so my, my good thing this week is something um, kind of meaningful, but also kind of silly. Um, so I was gifted on Valentine's Day uh, the Nintendo Switch version of Mario Kart. Now, why this is my good thing is like for so many different things, but like it takes me back to like my child self that was just so full of wonder and imagination. Um, and so my good thing is just not not just like the the video game itself, but mm -hmm. it's sort of that mindset, that imagination, that creativity, that wonder. Um, and I think there's a part in our in our book of common prayer after the baptism where we pray that the person that we are baptizing never loses that sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. um, and so like it was, just, you know, it was a, it's a video game, right? It shouldn't be that deep, but it's me. So it is that deep. <laughs> and it was just a reminder of just like what a gift it is to create and imagine and wonder um, and how easy it is to just lose that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's so true. It is so easy to lose that, right? Yeah. And I love it. I love that you're so you're the Mario Kart generation and I'm the Mario Brothers generation. Yeah. <laughs> like the original. <laughs> Which is still about the only video game I'm capable of playing. Yeah. <laughs> like Mrs. Pac Man. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. So what's your good thing? So my good thing is pretty also kind of funny. I don't know that there's any deep spiritual meaning, but it just was such this moment of like, this is my life. Okay, so these glasses, it has to do with these glasses that I'm wearing today. So it's really cold here. Um, and uh, it we had ice before we had snow. And so, so I have a bunch of readers. These are readers. They, they're part of my Zoom persona because mm -hmm. I cannot see anyone without them, right? Like, <laughs> I've had multiple people who have seen pictures. They're like, did you always wear glasses? I'm like, no, this is the result of <laughs> being old and having to live on Zoom now. So I have, but I have all these inexpensive readers because I'm always losing them. Like, mm -hmm. I'm all, you know, I have a million pairs and I'm always losing them. Uh, but they're each special, you know, to me. Well, mm -hmm. um, I've suddenly begun this habit of accidentally losing them in the wild, like the literal wild. So I have it because <laughs> like they're not on my face all the time, but I have right. to keep them on me to like read my phone or whatever. And uh, so way back in the summer, fall, in the fall, the early fall, I had a pair um, with me and my husband and I were on a boat out in the middle of the lake and he was driving the boat really fast. And I guess I had them like on my vest mm -hmm. and they flew off at some point. So yeah. I lost that pair in the in the lake you would think i would learn well <laughs> this past week it's been so cold and we've been stuck inside and so saturday we knew the snow was coming but the ice had pretty much melted so we had this window even though it was really cold where we could go outside and do something mm -hmm. right so we went to a local state park and did this great trail, you know, but we had all the coats and all the mittens and the hats and all the things and we walked this great trail we had a, a great time together but apparently at some point with my taking off the mittens and the things and the getting the phone out to take pictures, 
the pair of glasses that I had in my pocket fell out and I didn't know. <laughs> so I lost another pair. Of glasses. So I don't realize this, of course, until we're getting back in the truck and we're getting mm-hmm. in the truck and I'm like, oh no, I've lost another pair of glasses. And for some reason, I just am like, I start, I guess I'm digging around in the truck to make sure I hadn't left them in the truck. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, I pulled these out from between the seats mm-hmm. that I had lost three months ago. Yeah. Like, like hadn't been able to find. And it was just one of those, you know, that song he gives and takes away. Yep. <laughs> that, like, I mean, you know, that was just like the, the thought that come in, that came into my head of just, I lost that one pair of glasses, but then I found this pair of glasses. And yep. it just, it just made, I just had to laugh and giggle yeah. and, and be like, this is exactly life. Like it's yeah. just this constant give and take. You lose one thing, something else turns up. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just glasses, but it just, it was just really funny. And we got a big laugh out of it. And, and just, this is the story of life, right? Yeah. Well, that's like me and chapstick. Like I, in theory, I think I probably have like 20 of them, but I can only ever find like 10 of them at a time. Right. The other 10 are lost somewhere in the world and I will find them when I need them. <laughs> like it just inevitably there is a, there is a set somewhere. <laughs> And I was like, maybe someone will find those glasses again. Like somebody yeah. else will find them when they need them. So well, it reminds me of um one time I had a Bible I really, really liked. Like you know, you, ever, you just find a Bible, it's the right size, it's the right translation, like it's just everything. Um and I, for whatever, like I lost this Bible and I was so upset because like, I couldn't even remember where I got the Bible from. So I couldn't like order another one. Um and I finally like got to a good place with it by saying, I'm going to trust that wherever that Bible is, it is in the hands of someone who needs it more than I do. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, because as you can see, like I have tons of Bibles <laughs> behind me. Like I don't need a Bible. Right. Right. <laughs> but like, you know, it, so I, what I hear is like, you know, just holding things lightly and yes. having a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. That it's it, what's what you need will come. What yeah. you don't need will go. Right. Yeah. Like, just again, yes, having that lightly. Oh, yeah. I love it. All right. Well, who do we have today? So we have Mike Rudin and Wayne Blackwell, who are from Haywood Street Church in Asheville, North Carolina. And the reason I want to have a chance to talk to them um, is because early on in COVID, um, we had a bunch of churches who were trying to figure out, like, what are we going to do for outreach? Like, everything is changing. And I was just really, really inspired by the work this church was doing, is doing, will continue to do, not only as it pertains to those who struggle with um, homelessness and hunger, but also in how they're embodying a kind of ministry um, around compassion and mercy. And I'll let them talk about it more, but I just wanted to talk to them because I think it's such good news for the church. That's awesome. Let's bring yeah. them on. Okay. I'll know more. Hi. There they go. Hey Hello. guys. Hey, Mike and uh, and Wayne. So I know Mike. Wayne, I, we know each other via email, but I wonder if the two of you can introduce yourselves and then tell us, uh, tell our viewers what you do and who you are. Sure. You want to go ahead? No, Mike, you can go first, buddy. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, like Mike said, um, we know each other through the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. Uh, I am an Episcopal priest, but I, I am the associate pastor at a Methodist mission in Asheville, North Carolina, Haywood Street Congregation. And so um, that job is pretty broad. And part of that work is that I supervise uh, one of our ministries that's called the Mercy League. And so Wayne and I work together in Mercy League. Yeah. Um... My name is uh, Wayne Blackwell, and um, I am not an Episcopal priest or a Methodist priest or anything. I'm just uh, a faith-based guy who uh, has some lived experience of being homeless on the street, and and um, I'm a recovering heroin addict, too. So I have a, a perspective to help people that some people don't have. Well, thank you both for being here. Um, so I've gotten to know a little bit about Mercy League um, based upon what Mike, what you shared with me, but I wonder if you all could tell me what is Mercy League and where did it come from? What, you know, what were, what were the dreams that were happening while this ministry was being birthed? 
well, um, sure. Wait, I want you to tackle that one because you you were there before me, and and you were there as yeah. it started. Um, we're in, the work that we do at Hayward Street is a uh, it's um urban ministry. We deal with a lot of people that you know have addiction problems, have mental health problems, and all that. And a, a lot of times comes with that a lot of chaos, a lot of fighting, a lot of other stuff. And we were trying to figure out ways to handle that without involving police. Um, that was the key thing. And and I was kind of doing it by myself a little bit. And we had another pastor that came in and we just formed this thing called the Mercy League to where we have relationships with everybody that comes there. I actually live in the community. I ride the city transportation. I actually live there. So um, we, we know people on a personal basis. So we're able to, you know, when disturbances or, or, or chaos, you know, just erupts, we're able to call people by name. Um, we know people's personal history. And a lot of times we can calm people down by just being with them. Mm. So um, that's a big thing of what we do in the Mercy League is going toward people with mercy and grace when, when a lot of times they wouldn't get mercy and grace when situations are um, chaotic. Great. And so our ministry is about trying to figure out how we can keep everyone at church, right? We never want to have a situation where someone has to leave our campus because if you're being asked to leave Haywood Street, you're probably not allowed anywhere else either. Mm -hmm. And we always want to be that sort of respite for people who feel like it's so hard for them to fit in at other communities or to find a place where they're just accepted and loved for who they are as they are in that exact moment. Mm -hmm. And so the work that people who are watching us might see is when you know someone draws a knife on someone else and we get in the middle of it and there's no you know all out brawl that happens because Wayne knows somebody from the bus or you know got someone a pair of boots after a big rainstorm or something like that. But what it's really about, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg, is what actually happens in conflict when we're de-escalating. We're only able to do that because people love us and trust us. And there's a kind of mutual vulnerability. People have to feel like they know me, not simply as the pastor of Haywood Street congregation, but as Mike, and that they know Wayne as Wayne and who we are as human beings. And because we can be on the same level as them, that they'll trust that we can keep them safe. And we have to trust that when we see people in their most difficult um, moments that that's not motivated by uh, malice or evil, but softened fear. And so how can we step into a situation um, in a grounded way and kind of suck that fear out of a situation so that you know what's left is truth and reconciliation and the ability for people to settle their differences peacefully. Yeah, I think Mike said that really well. I don't know how to word it like that, but when I know people and I know their lives, I know their girlfriends, I know their brothers and sisters. So when they're in that moment of, you know, that fighting or whatever, because it mostly is fear-based, they're scared. You know, I can go up and put my arm around him and say, come on, Chad, let's go over here, even though he's got a machete in his hand. You know, I think that's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. I noticed just kind of poking around on the website a little bit um, that relationship really does seem to be the core at the heart of everything y'all do and kind of every aspect of the various ministries. And that even in terms of volunteers, you call them companions, mm -hmm. not volunteers. Um, can y'all speak to that? Like how, you know, the philosophy behind that decision and that terminology? Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak on that. So I think, and you know, that term existed far, far before my tenure at Hayward Street began, but the way that I understand it and um, this sort of ideology in myself began when um, I sort of converted to Christianity through uh, the Catholic worker movement. Mm -hmm. And there people who, there were very blurred distinctions between who was serving and who was being served. And I think that that's what we're trying to do at Haywood Street is um, when we orient new companions, 
we're taking people a lot of times who are from very privileged backgrounds um, in some in some ways, right? Maybe materially privileged, but who have their own, you know, kinds of pasts and wounds and things that they're trying to heal from and grow in the midst of. And then right beside them, you know, in the dish room, we have people who are in active addiction or recovering from addiction. And these people all blending together, uh, offering their gifts and their talents to, you know, make our community a little bit better. And so what we're trying to do in the midst of that is get people away from the idea that they're doing charity, that, you know, they are this sort of completed um, and, and perfect spiritual vehicle who is, you know, giving something to someone else who happens to be less fortunate than themselves. When we all come to see that we're coming around the table and we're all broken and we need the love and grace of one another and of God, then that's when we start to create true community. And, you know, there are always different kind of distinctions that blur us. I'd be a fool to say that, you know, we've eliminated all kind of distinctions of race or class or whatever it may be. But these kinds of um, environments allow us to at least begin conversations and ways of understanding one another and one another's lives in ways that we wouldn't otherwise. What do you think, Wayne? Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Mike said. Um, you know, there was a thing, I went and listened to Dr. Greg Boyle speak in Charlotte one time, and he said something that stick with me through this whole time doing this stuff is, you know, we can't erase the margins from living outside and we've all got to live in the same to be able to erase the margins in life. We can't be outside them and only go in for a couple of minutes. I think we have to all live inside the margins to be able to erase them. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that, it's important. Wayne hasn't said this, but Wayne lives in the church. And so, yeah, I live in the church. Uh, so Wayne and our, uh, he's more than our chef. He's what we call our banquet steward. He organizes. Mm -hmm all the meals, uh, Dave, he also lives in the church. And mm -hmm. so we've built this kind of intentional community in the midst of church. Mm -hmm. as, as you all are sharing, um, one of the things I was sort of thinking about is, you know, that the idea of the church being this like community of mercy, uh, which is something that we're called to be, is not something that we can do outside of that relationship, right? Like we have to be willing to really dig deep into the relationships, not only within our church, not only folks outside of our church, but how do we actually, you know, begin blurring the lines between in church and out of church, right? Like I, I, that's kind of what I hear and what I see um, and how that is such a challenge, I think, to a lot of models I see of outreach mission, you know, like whatever you want to call the word, you can play around with the word, but like it's, this is such a different model because it is deeply rooted in the relationship. Um, and it's what I see Jesus doing, right? Like Jesus not only goes around and heals and breaks bread and whatnot, but like all of those things to me feel like venues to something deeper. They are opportunities to make a connection with other people and with, with the community. Um, and I think that, and the reason, this is, this is why I really wanted to speak to you all, because I think this is such wonderful good news for our church as we all think about what we're called to do, it's really about relationship. How do we build relationships with people, not necessarily go outside of our church with, with our hands really to give people things, but how do we go with our hearts open, with our minds open, you know, with our lives open, ready to receive the holy holiness of the other person that we'll see, even as you're talking about, even if we're meeting them on their worst day, right. um, that there's still something incredibly holy about that person that we're called to meet. Yeah. yeah, you know, oh, go ahead, Wayne. Now, I just think it, it's, I mean, you have to spend other days, not just like if you're having a meal, not just spend that day. You got to spend a lot of time in community to be mm -hmm. able to see the good in people. If you only see the bad, then, you know, that's what everybody in the world sees. But when you spend that time and you see the stuff that people do on the street for themselves as family, you know, it's just amazing to see how that is really true if you take the time to be in it. Yeah. 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 And being able to meet people, you know, on their own terms and on their turf, um, you know, not just 
meeting and being with people when they're, you know, in the kitchen at our church. But mm -hmm. what about when they're out at Pritchard Park playing chess, you know, it's the park downtown, or what about when they're outside of the hot spot, which is where everyone, you know, gets a 40 ounce. What about, you know, mm -hmm. the places that are um, where they feel most comfortable perhaps. Yeah. And of course, being in the middle of a pandemic has made that a little bit more challenging, but we've also uh, accrued a level of trust where, you know, we can be in those kinds of places and um, get to know people at, at their best. Um, and speaking on grace, just, you know, I, I don't know that we've begun to practice grace or mercy until we've made some kind of sacrifice. Um, and I found that's where I've grown the most spiritually during this ministry is when I've felt um, scared or angry or annoyed and been pushed by the people around me who have been able to motivate me to continue to put my best foot forward and try to do the right thing for someone. Um, you know, just thinking of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's idea of grace, right? And cheap grace and costly grace. And I think that a problem that a lot of our churches, especially with mission and outreach work that we get ourselves into is that, you know, we can practice grace until it gets hard, until it, you know, sacrifices the core identities that we hold so dear, until someone who is psychologically unwell is disrupting the Eucharist or until, you know, something happens that we're uncomfortable with. And when that's the case, you know, we've never really practiced grace at all. We've just done something to entertain ourselves. Yeah. yeah. I don't think as a church we can't be scared to go where people are in those situations. Because I think that's where we learn the most about people when they're in those situations. So I don't think as a church we can be scared of that. And because if we're scared of it, it'll never change. We'll always be separated. Having lived on both sides of it. So, you know, it's it's really true. So um, I love this. So I love to watch home improvement shows. Okay. <laughs> no secret to anyone who knows me. Um, and recently I heard this great quote on this one. This this couple was trying to redo like a, a, a craftsman style house, right? So like 1918, whatever. And um, they were at they were at the point in the in the project where they just wanted to be done, right? Like they were annoyed, they were tired, they were stressed out. They just wanted to be done. And the person who was helping them, the, the designer who'd come in to help them said, wait, is this a rust, a, a restoration project or a rush duration project? Mm -hmm. Right. And I just mm -hmm. love that analogy because I think so often what it takes to do the restoration is the time is the sacrifice is the investment of, um, you know, of money, of sweat, of um, waiting, of doing it right versus just rushing, slapping a Band-Aid on it and being done. And um, and I think in our ministries, especially in our outreach ministries, we hit those walls pretty quickly where we don't know what to do with the person who's disruptive during Eucharist. We don't know how to form relationships with people who are across the food pantry counter from us, right? When we only see them to hand them a bag of groceries. Um, and so what would you, what advice, what practices, how do you begin to shift that narrative within your, within your parish, within your community to look at it as a restoration project and not a restoration project, right? To just feel good about doing something and checking a box. Um, yeah, how do you how do you do that long haul work? How do you learn how to, to appropriately um, respond to someone being disruptive or or begin those conversations? Wayne, do you wanna you wanna go ahead first on that one? Well, the biggest thing I try to do is learn people's names. I mean, they're not just the crazy guy or other guy causing the problem. I mean, being able to call somebody by their name means a whole lot. When I was homeless, it was many times I felt like I just could not be seen at all, you know. So I think that's a big thing. We try to learn people's names. You know, we try to learn, you know, where they're at, where they stay at, a little bit about their lives. It's not just, yeah. I just think the more you learn about a person, the more you can connect with them. Yeah. My, so my experience with companions and how we might integrate, you know, 
our community together is a little bit limited insofar as we've had to drastically reduce the number of folks who we have moving through our church right now with, with the pandemic, right? So we're focused on serving meals and doing that with a skeleton crew and our Mercy League is a skeleton crew and, you know, everything is operating sort of at um, the lowest possible threshold. But with that being said, I think, and maybe this is um, a little bit crude, but I think that the people who aren't ready to do that leave. Um, because when you see someone pull out a machete, like that's kind of, I mean, it freaks me the heck out all the time. And like, if you're not ready to be at a place that's as like shocking oftentimes as Haywood Street, um, you're going to go volunteer your time somewhere else. And we sort of prime people. So we have um, a companion introduction, right? We'll tour the church and we'll um, tell them a little bit about who we are. And we say, you know, some crazy stuff happens here. And, you know, you've got to be willing to, you know, respect your boundaries and your safety, but also to know and expect that these things are going to happen and to be able to, you know, move in the midst of it. And we might not be the right place for you. We want to be, and we want to help to foster your growth. If you know you think you're being called here, but you have reservations, and you know at the end of the day, we end up having God. We had uh, a college philosophy professor writing an 800-page volume on Kant, working in the dish room with like you know guys who are like pretty wasted or like, you know, and they all get along They're buddies. They're just friends and, you know, they get one another and you would never think that that would be the case, but he was ready to, you know, jump into what we were offering. And so we're always there to help uh, move people through some of those struggles and have those conversations about things that make them uncomfortable at church. But we also, you know, we tend to, um, naturally weed out people who, who aren't meant to be there. But I think it's amazing once you do take that step and you and you see that first chaotic thing happen and you see how we handle it and, and, and then you get less scared and less scared. I yeah. think that that the benefit far outweighs that little scared part you get. Yeah. I, I, you know, as, as, as scary as chaos can be, like yeah. our tradition teaches us actually that chaos is like the perfect soil for creation, right? Like God created the world out of chaos. Like that's what that's what happened. And Mike, you and I, like I, you and I shared this story, but like when I was in my CPE, um, I was, we were touring sites to potentially be placed in. And I, you know, it was the end of a long day, it was hot. It was the summer in Atlanta. Um, and we went to Church of the Common Ground uh, which is the mission of the Diocese of Atlanta there. And as we walked into Church of the Common Ground, there was like a fight happening, like literally as like these students were walking in to like see if they want to be here. And when I saw the way the community was able to de-escalate that situation mm -hmm. without bringing in kind of law enforcement, mm -hmm. and like, and it was the community, it, it, it was like people coming around one another, support, and it was, it was chaotic and it was messy and there was something incredibly holy about that experience. Um, and Wayne, it reminds me of, of when you talked about like the, the, the things that are important to us, they remain important to us. It, they're not just things that are important to us when it's easy, but when it's hard is when things are important to us. And it reminds me of a movie I saw on Hulu uh, like last week or something called Irresistible. Uh, which is about election things and whatnot. But one of the things that a character says, like there's a town hall meeting um, and the town is, or the city council is looking to vote on some some law or something, stripping benefits from people who are undocumented. Um, and one of the uh, people in the town stands up in this town hall meeting and says, our values are not values if they don't stick with us when times get hard. Right. And so you know that things are, are your values because when it's difficult, when it's chaotic, they're the things you hold on to. Um, and so when, when I think hear of things like Mercy League, I hear like these incredible values of compassion uh, and justice and mercy and love and welcome really being values, not just being something you put on like a banner outside the yeah. church 
hoping that like by yeah. osmosis it will like get onto you. But it's yeah. like things that you practice. These this is a way of life that you practice and invite people into. Yeah, and you you learn its value over time with the stories that that unfold. You know, I could share one of the times that I've been most scared in my first year at Haywood Street was um, there's this guy I'd never seen him before. He had kind of big mutton chops and a lot of tattoos, and he was nonverbal on campus. And someone had done something to upset him. And he had pulled out a machete, and there was no one who knew him, so there was no way for us to feel like we could effectively kind of de-escalate. And he, frankly, in that moment was unpredictable. And thankfully, um, one of our coworkers, Mark, was, was able to, you know, kind of end things. And, and I remember thinking, gee, can this guy be around anymore? And, and we had some serious conversations about that. Now, fast forward one month. Um, it had been pouring rain a couple of weeks prior and he just looked, you know, terrible, just boots drenched. And we had this really nice pair of boots downstairs. So we went and got the nonverbal guy a pair of boots. And all of a sudden, you know, where he wouldn't acknowledge us, if we said hello, he starts to kind of talk to us a little bit. So one month later, another similarly um, hard day, two different people squaring off with knives, very contentious. Thank God nobody gets hurt. It all calms down. It's raining very hard that day and he's under some of our tents in the parking lot. This guy Rooster, the guy who was nonverbal. I'm walking out there, I'm clearly looking dejected and he looks at me and he says, you know, your guy's job is really hard and I'm so grateful for you and thank you. And he just kind of sat there and he hugged me and we just kind of broke down the day. And that one story for me crystallized so well what the entire project is about. Because there was an opportunity to meet someone on their worst day, to not throw them out or cast them aside, but to continue to say, what is everything that we can do to include this person in community? Then we see that same person on their best day. And that person can remind me that the other person has something to offer, something holy mm -hmm. for, for everyone, right? Maybe it'll just be on another day. Yes. And you see that most every time. It's not only the time I don't see that to where it comes together like that. If, if you take enough time. Yeah. That's amazing. So I want, there's been a lot of hard stuff about COVID. Um, and I, I, you said you're, you're working with a skeletal crew in, in the various areas. Um, has something good, you know, come up? Has, has there been a something that maybe y'all wouldn't have gotten to, um, you know, that because of having to slow down or be fewer people or, or whatever it is, um, whether it's in the community or in the ministry, and those are very blended. <laughs> but um, yeah, is there something good that um, a ray of light in all of this um, for y'all? I think for me, I get this to meet so many more people I probably wouldn't have met if I hadn't been outside the whole time. If mm -hmm. I, I usually go back and forth between the outside and inside the church. If I wouldn't have been outside the whole time, there probably wouldn't have been people I'd have missed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Things are much slower and you take people, more people who were, who were on our campus pre COVID inside in a cramped kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then you put them all outside and thank God for the most part, our weather has, has been pretty cooperative mm -hmm. and people are more spaced out, you know, things are more peaceful and there's more slow time to just sit and talk with people and not be pulled in a different direction. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's been a really big blessing, um, especially as I started my ministry here. So I, I began my job March 1st. So I spent yeah. two weeks inside and then um, everything changed. And yeah. so um, it was a really good way for me to meet people and to get people to know me more quickly because mm -hmm. we were meeting each other in a time of, of crisis. Mm -hmm. 
And so trust built faster than I think it would have otherwise and just allowed me to feel like I became a member of the team, Mm -hmm. um, you know, really quickly. Yeah. Mike, I, I feel like I appreciate what you just offered because there, I mean, so I know a lot of people who have taken new positions, new calls and whatnot during like this pandemic. And I think up until you just said that, I've only been able to reflect that, oh, how hard it must be. And it is that, like, I don't want to take away from that. But what you just shared is this opportunity to enter a community where you're all navigating the same crisis together. Yeah. Um, How that must, but while that is difficult, there's also a particular charism and gift to that because you are working through it together. You're finding your way forward together. There's a certain way you get to know each other in the crucible of crisis mm-hmm. um, that you don't sort of get to know each other outside of it. Um, right. You know, I mean, it's just the most explicitly and obviously pastoral time and event mm-hmm. or cluster of events, right? Yeah. Right. And, you know, Marcus, you and I both having worked in Connecticut, we yeah. can both, we don't have to do a lot of legwork to imagine the you know, landed church that many folks walk into where mm-hmm. you know, our emotions are very reserved yep. and pastoral conversations can be pretty difficult. Yeah. But in the midst of this, I think, you know, even the most buttoned up, yep. um, reserved, tough to crack people yep. are needing intimacy and conversation and honesty. Yep. And so it's such a good time to be able to just get to know the you know, deeper depths of people. It's almost like hospital chassis, right? You walk into the mm-hmm. hospital room and someone's ready to bear their life to you in the first five yeah. minutes of having known them yeah. because of the urgency of the place. Yeah. Um, you know, the parish has kind of started to reflect that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I've shared with my own community that this this is an opportunity, I think, for us to be aware of our own sense of grief but also to be aware that everyone else around us that we see, whether or not they ever set foot into this building are dealing with that grief. So how can we, to sort of pick up on what you two were speaking about earlier, how can we be those merciful presences in our community? How can we seek to really build relationships with people um, that maybe we took for granted before? Um, Like, you know, early on in the pandemic, a lot of people in my parish were talking about uh, they actually got to talk to their neighbors that they had lived next to for decades, but had never spoken to before. Wow. But that yeah. this pandemic was giving them opportunities yeah. to actually speak to their neighbors. And how wonderful of a gift that is to actually take the time in the crucible of this crisis yeah. to build those kinds of relationships. That way you can be that merciful presence in the community. You know, you can respond to them on their worst day because you know them on their best day. Like that, I'm gonna take that that worst and best day bit. Like I'm gonna take that's my little nugget of wisdom I'm taking from both of you because that's such a that's such a, a piece of joy because we oftentimes we do tend to reduce people to their worst day, right? But none of us right. is our worst day. All of us are so much more than that, and to treat one another on our worst day. Um, like we know someone on their best day is such a wonderful piece of wisdom. Yeah, and it you know, transferring that that principle to ourselves mm-hmm. too, right? When we can see that in another person, and mm-hmm. we can come to see that in ourselves when we're having a day where we're not particularly patient or graceful or merciful, that that's not mm-hmm. the whole story about who we are, mm-hmm. uh, nor something you know, attaching this massive significance to, but that we know that tomorrow will be another day, especially Mm -hmm. in a pandemic that's so important and something that we've had to practice as a staff. Um, We have a weekly self-care group and being able to name the times where we have not done, you know, the admirable thing or where we've struggled in our life outside of church and to have a place where those things are, held and confidential and we can, you know, just share presence with one another has been so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. As y'all can see, sorry, the um my <laughs> companion, my shadow here 
Gus. Hi. <laughs> uh, he's having a, a, a stressful day. Because oh, that's all right. We're having. So he was like, he wanted he to be in here. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I love uh, yeah, you're in you're in Arkansas, right? So I'm in Arkansas, yeah. And and we're having a snow apocalypse. Wow. Um, it's about we're at about nine inches of snow. I oh think. my so, god. <laughs> so it's a whole different a whole different ball game um for all of us right now. Well, thank you all for being here. This has wow. been wow. Um, such a gift to get to to know y'all and to hear about the Mercy League and the church and we're going to put links to um, your website and things in the show notes so that people who who are interested um, can check out. And there's a lot to check out. Um, there's even something yeah. called Fresco, which I think has to do with the arts. And yeah, yeah a lot of different yeah. ways. <laughs> so thank you all for, yeah. for Wayne's in the Fresco. So if you go oh, on the yeah, website, yeah, exactly the far right it. corner. All right, corner. <laughs> got right now. That's how I got here. I got injured. I got injured about six years ago. That's how I got involved here. So yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Really cool. yeah. We'll have oh. Well, thank you all for being with us. All right. Us. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. I really right. appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Bye. That. Yeah. I. It's one of those things. It's one of those things I think, and this I feel like this is like a, a recurring theme on our on our on our show, which is the things that we're called to do are simple, mm-hmm. right? It's relationship, it's building, it's it's saying someone's name. Yes. It's so like I, I remember my own experience when I was at Church of the Common Ground, which is a church that it, you know is comprised of people who are inactive or you know recovering addiction or people who are homeless or hungry or things and what i was told is that so oftentimes people who who are poor or people who um struggle with homelessness and hunger are oftentimes ignored they're never called by their name yep. um you know and i remember our tradition values the name right that we value one another's names that we are human beings with dignity and so you know that whole idea of just that relationship, building those fundamental deep relationships with people for the long haul, not for the next project, not to check off a list, right? Not just to fill out the parochial report, although please fill out the parochial reports. <laughs> um, but it's about it's about relationships, the kind that God has with us that we're called to have with everyone else. That's right. It's so true. I So for a period of time, I worked um, at a school where my kids were in attendance. It's kind of why I was working there, right? I wanted to be on their schedule. And <laughs> um, it was like the closest I got to homeschooling. Like I didn't want to actually homeschool them, but I mm-hmm. wanted to be on their schedule. So yeah. I got to work at their school for a few years. And uh, this was a, a school in a, a urban downtown area. We didn't have a bus system. Um, and so dismissal was this whole thing. And part of what we did for dismissal um, for the kids that were getting picked up by cars is they would sit on this hallway and you had to call their car number, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's how they would know to leave. Well, um, there were the older kids, the teenagers, the high schoolers, especially, you, you needed to be kind of quiet in this mm-hmm. area or you wouldn't be able to hear your number was the mm-hmm. thing, right? And we had everything from kindergarten to high school. And um, the high schoolers, I learned really quickly that if I learn their names, mm-hmm. junior high, and especially the high school kids, if I learn their names, they would, re- you know, and it was like, oh, who is she that she knows my name? I've mm-hmm. been seen, right? Mm-hmm. And I was in part doing it to get their attention, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then right. Be like, please be quiet because we can't. <laughs> but I really, that is when I began to learn the power of name yeah. because it began to establish a relationship. Yeah. Um, with us and and yeah the same thing my husband does this lovely thing of everywhere we go if someone has a name tag on yeah says thank you to them like a the grocery person right or the waitress and he'll say thank you cynthia or thank you bill have a great day and and call them by name and it makes a huge difference you know so yeah yeah, maybe maybe for those of us who can't who aren't ready for a machete knife intervention yet, yeah, <laughs> right. Which I love how they were like, you might not be ready, right? Maybe you start by learning the neighbor's name or using right. the 
of every person in a service industry that we encounter, right? right. Um, yeah. Or the kids on our street, whatever, yeah. right? Look, I, I'm imagining, you know, I was at my church very, for like six months or so uh, before COVID. And I'm thinking about like, what might it mean now to go to people around my church and just stop in the shops and say, hey, I'm not here to buy anything, but I am the priest at such and so, just wanted to get to know you. Like that small interaction, I think, is can begin to build those relationships, right? Um, and it's, you know, it's not a program, right? It, it doesn't take any budget except that I got to, you know, get in my car and drive, you know, use some gas or whatever, go down the highway. But um, it's so small. And I think it can make such a huge impact. Um, yeah. You know, when we introduce ourselves as, you know, hey, I'm, I'm your neighbor. I don't live in the neighborhood, but I worship right here. And I'm here to, just to get to know you and, you know, what's going on in the community. Yeah. Right. Not to try to get you to come in, but to right. know you, right? Right. Yeah. I've, I've, there have been times, um, especially when I did more youth and family children formation work, where people have asked, you know, we want to start a children's ministry. We have no budget. We're a small church. You know, where do I start? And I said, does every adult know the name of every child? Mm. In the church. Start there. Yeah. Once, yeah. once you've accomplished that, it will come. What right. needs to come next? But right. until every adult knows every child. Right. Right. So right. start with the name. Yeah. Uh, so good. I love this show. <laughs> One of the best jobs. Uh, well, thank you, Marcus. Well, blessings on your snowstorm. Thank um, you. I wish I could take some and just add it to the pile we have outside, but. <laughs> yeah. It'll last for about a week and then we'll probably be in flip flops and shorts again. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>